Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Dr. Josh Lebert has taught you various good concepts about planning for experiments for biomarker discovery, how a very novel protein microarray platform like nucleic acid programmable protein array or NAPA can be utilized for many applications. Today he is giving his last lecture where he is going to talk to you about a case study in which how NAPA technology could be utilized for the functional studies. There are various type of modifications, post transition modification happens which makes protein functional which gives them different properties and which are very crucial to study. However, studying PTMs are not very straightforward, not very easy. There are variety of modification happens as you are aware like phosphorylation, glycosylation, acetylation and there are some newer forms like addition of AMP, AMP acylation etc. All of those are very crucial for understanding a given cellular context. So, Professor Lapid will also summarize all the various studies which have been covered during his section especially for the NAPA technology as well as the biomarker discovery program and other clinical applications. So, let us listen. Dr. Josh Lebert's lecture. Today, uh, since it's the last lecture of the series, is focus a little bit more on um, sort of functional studies that we've been doing with the NAPA, uh, with a fairly heavy emphasis on our most recent story. Um, but I just thought it would be useful to, rec you know, one of the things that I keep saying is that the the proteins on the array are active and I think probably one of the best bits of evidence for that is when we test function of these proteins, protein protein interaction, uh, enzyme substrate activity that sort of thing, uh, we, we usually get it and so that is kind of how we look at it. So, um, the first one of the first stories that we, we looked at was ampelation. So, um, you are all familiar with this part of the pathway where you have ATP and the gamma phosphate on ATP is added to threonine serines or tyrosines on proteins in a process that we call phosphorylation and that is usually catalyzed by an enzyme called a kinase, right. So, you are all you have seen that a million times by now. So, it turns out that in some circumstances uh, a slightly different but very related reaction occurs in which the AMP, the adenosine plus the first phosphate get added to a protein. So, you get AMP threonine, AMP serine maybe and AMP th uh, tyrosine and that is called ampelation. So, you are taking the opposite half of the molecule and you are adding it to proteins and it, and it turns out that this process is remarkably well conserved if you look through evolution. So, if you look at many many bacteria and even in eukaryotic cells there are classes of enzymes called ampelators that will that will do this reaction and we do not fully understand what the biology of this interaction is, but one of the places where we see it the most often is when bacteria infect a, uh, an individual and uh, and then the bacteria use this to modify host proteins. So, it is possible that pathogens have used this as a way to regulate uh, reg expression in cells. So, the, the challenge with ampelation is that we do not really know what the targets are. Uh, it, it you know for years people have been trying to study what are the targets that are being modified by these enzymes. And um, when we began this work there was probably one bona fide target that we really knew about. There were two or three others that had been proposed, but not verified and the methodologies that people had used they had tried uh, um, 
you know, doing pull down experiments, they had tried doing mass spectrometry experiments, uh, they had done various chemical linkage experiments, but it was very hard to figure out what the targets were. So, we had a, we had a, a very uh, ambitious postdoc in the lab, Xiaobo Yu, and he wanted to see if he could use the protein array as a way of discovering what were the targets of these enzymes. So, the approach that he took to do this was um, the idea would be you, 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 print, you print an array, you express the proteins and you treat it with, with an ampullator that will add the amp group to the proteins and then you come back later and try to determine which proteins had the amp group on it. So, the initial approach that people thought would work would be you do this method, you have the amp group and you come in with an antibody that recognizes the, the AMP here. But it turns out that the antibody didn't work well. Uh, it was really not very selective and it didn't, didn't pick up what we wanted. And so, he came up with a different strategy that was very creative. So, the, the strategy he used is, is based on um, click chemistry. Basically, you take an alkyne group and an azide group. These are two chemical groups and they're reactive species, but, but they're very selective reactive species and in the presence of copper, they will, they will, they will form a chemical reaction that creates a covalent linkage and it requires copper for activity, but it's very selective. So, if you, if you run a, if, if you have uh, the azide group on one protein in a cell lysate and the alkyne group on the other protein, even amongst millions of other proteins, only those two will link and nothing else will. So, it's very selective. So, so what he, what he did was um, he worked with a, a group, uh, Howard Wong in New York, who had made a, an, a, a modified version of ATP in which he'd put this alkyne group right here, that's the alkyne group on an, a, on an ATP that was linked to the sugar, so it was part of the AMP molecule, okay. And, um, and so, uh, the idea then would be you take a protein array, you translate the proteins, you remove, it turns out that um, one of the things that, that Chabot discovered was that to get this to work, he had to remove all the DNA from the array. So, you all realize that we print plasmids on the array to make the proteins. Once the proteins are made, you don't really need the DNA anymore and for a variety of reasons at times if you need to, you can digest away the DNA with DNase and you still have your proteins left on the array. So, that's what he did and then he added this, this alkyne modified ATP along with an ampullator that released a pyrophosphate and it added this, this uh, M, this modified AMP to whatever target proteins were there and now it's displaying this open alkyne group. He then came in with an azide linked to rhodamine which is a fluorescent marker, added that to the array and added copper and that added the, this it added, it caused the, the covalent linkage and displayed the, the, the fluorescent tag. So, essentially he was marking the modified proteins with this azide and then he came in with rhodamine with, with alkyne and he came in with rhodamine linked azide to find the proteins. So, then only proteins that are targets of the enzyme will light up. First thing he did was to make protein arrays. Here he shows you that he has the DNA. Remember we stained with a pico green to look for DNA that confirms that we had good printing. Then he expressed the protein and captured it and then he digested all the DNA using uh, uh, a DNase and so, if he stains for DNA again, it's completely gone, okay. And then, um, and this is just showing you, here's the DNA level before and DNA level after uh, treatment. Uh, then he tested with anti-GST antibody and showed that he still had all the proteins. So, this is kind of useful to know in some circumstances when you're going to be working with a protein array like Napa. If you don't want the DNA around, let's say you're doing a transcription factor study or something like that, you can digest the DNA away and you're still left with the proteins and it's still a perfectly good protein array. All right and then this just shows that when he did um, two different array studies, he got very reproducible results. Okay, so now he's got, now he's got this whole protein array displaying protein, no nucleic acid, no DNA on the chip and he wants to then treat that array with an ampullator 
plus this, this alkyne modified ATP, okay? So here is uh, the array if he treats it with modified alkyne ATP and buffer alone. So you don't see anything. That's good, right? You don't, if there's no alkyl, if there's no ampullator there, you don't want to see a signal. If you did, then that would mean that you had contamination. VOPS is a well-known ampullator and then IBPA FIC2 is also a well-known ampullator. When he treats with those guys, can you see that? All of a sudden, a few, not very many, but a few spots like these guys right here start lighting up. That's kind of the result that you're hoping for, right? When you're a researcher in the lab, when you're a graduate student in the lab and you see only a few spots light, that's what really gets you excited because if everybody lit up, then you know there was a lot of background and it probably didn't mean anything. But if only a few selective ones light up, that's a sign that you really found something. So this is what, what those spots look like. And of course, these are the identities of those spots. You can see that they have um, very clean signals, right? And of course, you don't see those signals over here on the control. Right, so um, by the time he was done with these experiments, and I'm not going to walk you through all the studies he did of these experiments, um, he, uh, he, this is what was known before he started. That was the only known target. And all of these targets in here were things that he uncovered by screening the arrays. So he found a couple dozen more new targets for this. When, when he actually looked at the targets, and I don't think I have the, um, the slide to show you for that work, but he actually found that there was a sequence motif that was common to all the targets, or at least most of the targets. And so he was able to identify what it was that the ampullators were looking for when they modified proteins. And a lot of the targets of these proteins turned out to be GTPase proteins. So that's one example of how you can use the array to, to study for enzyme substrate type interactions. Another, another assay, and I'm only going to show one slide from this, because it's still an early study. Um, is, is work that um, G. Cho in the lab has been doing. And again, I don't know, if, hopefully you can see the dark spot there, the dark spot there, the dark spot there. Um, he basically was looking for proteins on the array that autoacetylate. And so in this case, he was using an, an acetyl group that um, uh, was labeled. And then no, he was using an acetyl group that could be detected by an antibody. And then he, he treated the array with, with um, acetyl-CoA right there, um, incubated the array and just allowed the proteins to, to acetylate themselves, washed away all the reactants and then stained with the antibody and identified proteins that autoacetylate. So this is again a way to look for enzymatic activity on the array. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk about yet a third application and I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this one um, because I want to kind of walk you through what I think you want to do when you do these sorts of studies because one of the mistakes I see all the time as a journal editor and I, and I can't tell you how often I see this pretty much every day I'm rejecting at least two papers for this is people do one, one screen with a proteomics technology. Maybe it's a mass spec screen, maybe it's a protein array screen. They get the results and then they write it up or they get the results and they do some informatics and then they write it up. And they don't follow up on any hypothesis. They don't do any subsequent biology. They just simply say, here was my screen, here's what I got, ha you know, enjoy it. <laughs> and you know, for me, that's not really what scientists should be doing. They should be uh, using this tool to identify a hypothesis and then doing some kind of work to test that hypothesis. You don't have to follow up every lead, but you should follow up at least one or two so that by the end of your story, you've shown something new that you didn't know before. Because that's really the goal of science. Um, and so we, you know, we usually send those papers back to the authors and say this is good start, too preliminary. Go back and solve a problem and come back to us when you have a bigger story. Okay, so, so this is, um, th this is a, a, a NAPA array. Um, and what we're going to do here is we're going to um, express proteins on the array. So first, here you see um, the array stained with pico green which by now you all know means it's, it's the amount of DNA. And the fact that it's pretty even in its staining means that we did a pretty good job of printing. And then here what we've done is express the proteins and then, and then stain them with an anti-flag antibody. And the reason it's a flag antibody is in this particular circumstance, 
Um, these proteins, which are all kinases, happen to have the flag tag and not the GST tag. And it's just a good point to remind you that we, we are not wedded to any one tag. We've, we've done NAPA with MIC tag, with flag tag, with GST tag, with halo tag. It, it, it's, a, it's a technology that can be used a, a variety of different ways. Uh, in this case, we happen to have all the human kinases in the flag tag, so we use the flag tag. And this gives you a sense that the proteins are well expressed where they should be, right? Okay, so now the question we wanted to ask was, are these proteins phosphorylated? And so we, um, we took this array, and if we don't treat it with, uh, if, if we treat it with buffer and just, uh, but no ATP, and you stain it with an antiphosphotyrosine antibody, none of the proteins light up. So that means that after, if you strip the kinase, if you strip the proteins with phosphatase to remove the phosphates and stain with antiphosphotyrosine antibody, you won't see any, the, the proteins won't have phosphates. That, no surprise. The question was, were, they, were these proteins active? And so if we added back ATP to the array and just incubate the array with ATP, now some of the proteins are lighting up. All of these proteins are autophosphorylating. Right, because just by adding ATP to the protein on the array, they're, they're phosphorylating themselves on tyrosine. Okay, so that, that's really good evidence that all of these proteins are enzymatically active on the surface of the trip. Okay, and it was evidence to us that we had the possibility at least of, of exploring now the function of these proteins in the array setting. So one question that comes to mind is can you inhibit this activity using drugs? So the first experiment that, that um, Fernanda did, this was, my, this was a postdoc in the lab at the time, where she took a broad spectrum kinase inhibitor called storosporin, and storosporin inhibits most kinases. And she increased the dose of storosporin on the array, and so here's no ATP, here's full ATP, and then here's increasing amounts of storosporin, and as you can see, um, the kinase activity is headed, is, is decreasing due to the drug. It's not completely wiped out, but it's significantly inhibited. So that means that the enzymes are behaving as we expect them to. A more interesting question is can you selectively inhibit kinases? So can you use a kinase inhibitor that knocks out one kinase but not another kinase and will it also behave on the array? Right, and that's this experiment here. So many of you are familiar with this drug imatinib. Imatinib is the same thing as Gleevec. Gleevec is the, was the first selective drug inhibitor chemical inhibitor ever used to, to treat a targeted pathway in cancer. So I mentioned the other day that Herceptin was the first targeted pathway. That was an antibody. This was the first compound. This is Brian Drucker's work. Um, he, in, you know, essentially invented this molecule that selectively knocks out the BCR able protein. So people with a type of CML get this um, uh, translocated enzyme that links the BCR gene to the, the ABL kinase, and it activates a kinase, and it becomes an oncogene that turns on, that creates cancer. And using imatinib, you can put people into remission. In fact, there are long-term survivors now with that disease who've been treated with imatinib and who have never gotten their cancer back. So it's, it's a pretty promising compound. All right, so what I want you to look at first is this protein in the green circle, a green square, and you can see that this is um, the TNK2 kinase. And notice that no matter how much drug we add, it's still active. So the drug is not inhibiting TNK2. But if you look at BCR able, here it is here. Now it goes down a little bit. Now it's much down. And now it's completely down. So the drug is selectively knocking down BCR able, but it's not knocking down TNK2. Similarly, if you look at able, which is right down here, you can see that the able is also decreased. Okay, so, so on the array, these proteins are behaving exactly like you want them to. So we did a number of studies like this to convince ourselves that the array platform was behaving as we expected. And then we then decided, now can we discover something new with that? And so we started treating the array with other kinase inhibitors. And what we looked for in particular was, were these kinase inhibitors ever hitting a kinase that we didn't expect them to hit? And one of the first ones that Fernanda found was this one. So ibrutinib is a drug that's used to treat uh, an enzyme called BTK, or Bruton's tyrosine kinase. BTK is an important enzyme, a kinase, in the B cell pathway. And it plays a role in a lot of B cell cancers. So um, mantle cell lymphoma, for example, uh, relies on BTK. 
And ibrutinib has turned out to be a very useful drug in treating those patients. It inhibits the BTK. It essentially stops the growth of that tumor. Um, and it's well tolerated by patients. Not a lot of side effects. So we asked, you know, does ibrutinib inhibit anything else? So the first thing I'm going to point out to you is that. And that is ABLE1. ABLE1 was the example in the last slide. And you saw that ABLE1 was inhibited by imatinib. But ABLE1 is not inhibited by, by ibrutinib. You can see that the signal is the same in all four spots. Okay, so then we asked, well, is it working for BTK, which is the one it's supposed to work for? And that's in red. And sure enough, there's BTK. It's going down. It's going down even more. It's going down even more. So in this case, even though it's not affecting th this, this kinase, it is affecting that kinase. And then what Fernanda noticed by carefully reviewing these slides was this guy down here. Strong signal over here, weaker signal here, weaker signal there, and weaker, si weaker still over here. And lo and behold, that protein turned out to be ERBB4. That was pretty exciting, because if you think about it, the ERB family, right, so EGFR receptor, ERBB2, HER2 new, those, those are two of the most prominently known oncogenes in all of cancer studies, right? Um, there are very, very successful drugs against both EGFR and, and ERBB2. And now we found a drug against ERBB4. There wasn't a lot of data on ERBB4, and so that's why we decided to kind of pursue this story a little bit. So the first question we wanted to ask was, could, could this drug inhibit cell growth? So the first thing we had to look for was cells that had ERBB4 in it. Okay, now, the next thing we thought about was, what about um, artifact? What, what potential confounders could screw us up? So what else do we know about BTK as a drug? What does it normally inhibit? Ibrutinib. What, so it, it, the main target, the, the reason it was invented was to target what kinase? BTK, right? So if I put it, if I use it in a cell and it has BTK in it, then the reviewers are going to look at me and say, well, how do you know it's due to the ERBB4? It's probably due to the ERBTK. So our first thought was we need a cell line that has a lot of ERBB4 and no BTK, right? Okay. So it takes a little time to, you have to, when you do your experiments, you have to think about them a little bit and make sure you're doing them in a logical way. So that's what we did. We, we searched all, the CCLE is a, is a website that has thousands of cell lines and their gene expression labeled. And we, we scanned all those data, specifically searching for proteins that had um, high levels of ERBB4 and low levels of BTK. And then we ordered a bunch of them. And then the first thing we did was confirm by Western blot that these cell lines were as advertised. So here we show, here's our positive control that has BTK. All of these cell lines have no BTK. So that, we've taken care of that. That, that's not going to be a confounder. And then all of them have varying levels of ERBB4. So the protein is definitely present. And then this is just a loading control. Okay, so now we know that we have some cell lines that have both. And the first question we want to ask is, will BTK, will, will ibrutinib inhibit these cell lines? Because our, our hypothesis now, based on our protein array study, is that ibrutinib inhibits ERBB4, and we think that that might in some way inhibit some cell lines that rely on ERBB4 for their cell growth. Keeping in mind that no one's ever really shown that before. So we treated all these cell lines with, with uh, the brutinib, and what we saw was a range of activity. So some of them, this is relative, when I say relative cell viability, what that means is cell growth plus minus drug. So if it's 100%, it means that with drug, it's the same as without drug. If it's, if it's down around 25%, that means that with drug, it's inhibited by 75%. And so you can see that some of these cell lines out here were significantly inhibited by imatinib, uh, ibrutinib, uh, and these guys, not so much. So these guys look like they're resistant to drug. These guys look like they're sensitive to drug. You still with me? Okay. So then we did a dose response curve, which is the logical thing to do next. And, and that's what you get. So adding increasing amounts of drug, you see increasing inhibition of cell growth. So that looks like ibrutinib is inhibiting a cell line that has high ERBB4 
and no BTK. So you can't argue that this is due to BTK. Okay, and then, and then we did a couple of key controls. Uh, we looked at cell lines that were either ERBB4 negative or BTK negative, and sure enough, neither of these cells were responsive to drug. Okay, so let's, so let's think a little bit about the ERBB4 pathway, because one of the first questions that comes to mind is, okay, maybe you've added a drug that you think you've shown inhibits ERBB4 on your protein array. How do you know that it's really inhibiting it in these cells in a way that affects the cell pathway, the, the, the biochemical pathway by ERBB4? Because you have to show that, right? You can't just say, well, okay, it inhib inhibits in vitro, but I don't know what happens in vivo. So, so let's look at the pathway. Um, there are two pathways for ERBB4. There's a growth, growth survival pathway over here, and there's a proliferation pathway over here. Um, they're they're kind of similar. Um, ERBB4 also has an alternate pathway, uh, depending on the, the splice form that you use. But you, you can see that it signals directly. So ERBB4, like the other EGFR receptors, is a dimer. Um, there are, um, this is neuregulin binding here. There are other ligands that bind to this, this protein. It sends signals through the RAS pathway, the ras erc pathway. Uh, it also sends signals through the PI3 kinase AKT pathway via mTOR. Um, so these kind of look very similar. So if you were going to think about key parts of these pathways to test, you might look at these guys. AKT is a well-known oncogene that, that drives cell division. And then MEK and ERC, which are also um, oncogenes and play a role in uh, signaling through the transcription factors like the uh, June FOS and so on. The, all three of these proteins, AKT, MEK, and ERK, ha get phosphorylated when they're active. And we have good antibodies for those phosphoforms. So a good simple test would be when we inhibit the cells with ibrutinib, do we see a reduction in the phosphoform of these proteins which are downstream of ERBB4, right? And I wouldn't be telling you this if we didn't do that experiment, and that's the result. So here you see that, um, uh, first of all, ERBB4 itself is less phosphorylated with drug. So that tells you right there that it's already, that, that it itself is being inhibited by drug. And then here you see phospho-MEK is going down, not dramatically. phospho erc is definitely going down, and phospho-AKT is, is certainly going down. So, and keep in mind that the, the level of AKT is the same. So the protein is still there, it's just not as phosphorylated. Same is true of ERK, same is true of MEK. Although th this is a little bit bigger than that, I think. But you get the idea, right? So, so um, when we treat with a when we treat, treat with a brutinib, it inhibits um, the, the, ac the downstream pathway of, of um, ERBB4. Okay, so now what's the next objection we're gonna get from the reviewers? So we've shown that it inhibits the kinase, we've shown that it turns off the biochemical signaling pathway, right? We've shown that it's reliant on ERBB4 expression in cells, and, and, and it doesn't matter uh, the, if BTK is not there. What else do we have to worry about? What about other members of the, of the, the ERBB2 family, or ERBB family, right? So um, those proteins are all very similar. There's a very good chance that ibrutinib could also inhibit ERBB2, could inhibit it could inhibit EGFR. And so one of the objections a reviewer might make is, well, how do you know that it's specifically through the ERBB4 pathway and not through these other members of the, of the ERBB family? Because after all, they're really well known. We know they're cancer proteins, right? So, so that was what we occurred to us. You know, it might, it might inhibit uh, ERBB, uh, SARC family members. Some of these proteins in the literature had been listed by someone somewhere as being inhibited by, uh, by imatinib, uh, ibrutinib. So I keep confusing those. Although the, the data were not very strong. So, and then some of these had the cysteine residue, which is in the, the binding pocket where the drug seems to bind. And so it's possible that because they have that cysteine, like BTK, like ERBB4, they too might be inhibited. So the question we want to ask was if we, um, you know, could EGFR or ERBB2 be contributing to this ibrutinib response? Could it be that this is all due to these guys and not ERBB4, right? So, so how would you rule that out? Knock down, right. So you would take out, you'd take these guys out, right, and still see if you get the effect, right? 
So that's what we did. So we, we, we did shRNA. Here you can see that this is the level of EGFR using a, a, during um, shRNA that knocks down EGFR, we could significantly reduce EGFR. Um, notice that these shRNAs do not affect ERBB2 or ERBB4. And similarly, we had some ERBB2 shRNAs that knocked out ERBB2, did not affect EGFR, did not affect ERBB4. And yet, and yet, despite that we, despite knocking down EGFR or knocking down ERBB2, we still saw the drug effect. The drug still inhibited the cells. So now we can say that um, they're sensitive to ibrutinib even if you inhibit EGFR or even if you inhibit ERBB2. Okay. So, um, so then, the, then the question was, all right, I'm still not convinced. How do you know that, um, uh, not, can you prove to me that knocking down ERBB4 is really going to stop cell growth? So we're, we're going to a lot of extreme here because people have tried to study ERBB4 a lot and they haven't, they, they, people have tested it superficially but they haven't really spent a lot of time on it. But so far the data have not suggested it was an oncogene. So, that's why we wanted to spend some time on it. So, so we wanted to ask the question, can we knock down ERBB4 without the drug? How would you go about that? SHRNA. Right. So that's what we did. So here, here is in one of our cell lines, 522, this is one of the sensitive cell lines. Here's an ERBB4 SHRNA, clearly knocking down protein, right? And, st and, and um, if you knock down the protein, cell division gets reduced. So just knocking down ERB4 is sufficient to give you cell inhibition. Here's another cell line, knock down ERB4, once again you see reduced cell growth. Here's yet another cell line, knock it down, once again you see reduced cell growth. So knocking down um, ERB4 by itself using three different shRNAs in each case is sufficient to knock down cell growth. So we, we felt like we had pretty significantly demonstrated that this cell growth inhibition was due to, to um, ERBB4 inhibition. Um, and this is just to show you that when you knock down ERBB4, it doesn't affect EGFR or ERBB2. So that's yet another possible criticism is, well, okay, you're knocking down ERBB4, maybe you're also affecting EGFR or ERBB2, but we can show you that um, uh, we actually couldn't detect EGFR in these cells, but if you knock down um, you don't see any change in ERBB2, no change in ERBB2, no change in EGFR, no change, no change. So this was really due to EGF, uh, 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 ERBB4, yeah. Is there any other way to knock down those targets using drugs? There aren't any good drugs right now that we know of. I mean, obviously, we, were, we think we found one of the first uh, ERBB4 inhibitor. You could, oh, you could knock down. You could block the activity of EGFR, or you could have done that. You could have done that. Yeah, that, that would have been another way to do it. We actually just did it genetically, um, which was easy. But you, we could have gotten the drugs. Right. Uh, and then, of course, the, the other way to take out ERBB4 would be to do CRISPR. But that's a very involved process, and we didn't really need to go that long. Okay, so then um, kind of the last piece of this piece, this puzzle, was asking the question, uh, does this matter at all in biology, right? Would it matter in an animal? And so we took, we took these cells, created tumors out of these cells, grew tumors out of these cells in mice, and then either treated them with abrutinib or no abrutinib. And, and, and you can see the effect. So this is uh, tumor growth without abrutinib, and this is tumor growth with abrutinib, right? So clearly, even in animals, this was working. And notice that if you, take, if you take one of the resistant cell lines that's not ibrutinib responsible, that the use of ibrutinib doesn't really affect it at all. The difference is really over here where, um, where, uh, where we had a sensitive tumor. Okay, so now you remember when I started all this and I showed you a bunch of cell lines, um, several of the cell lines were sensitive to the drug, but quite a few of them were not sensitive to the drug. So the question then becomes, well, how come? Why, why are the non-sensitive cell lines resistant? Right? What, what makes them resistant? And I think, to me, that was the crux of the matter because historically, ERBB4 inhibition had not been a successful cancer or ERBB4 had not been an obvious oncogene. And I think part of that reason is because um, 
there's a lot of resistant cells, and so when you, when you when people did expect experiments, they sometimes stumbled on these resistant tumors, and they saw no difference, and so they decided it didn't ma matter at all. All right, so so we looked at the tumors that we had, and we looked to see if we could figure out what was different between the sensitive tumors and the resistant tumors. The responsive tumors are in blue, right, and then the resistant tumors are in red. And so looking at this at ERBB4 levels, you really couldn't see anything different from ERBB4. Um, even phospho ERBB4, not really an obvious difference. Here's a resistant cell line with very strong phospho ERBB4. Here's a sensitive cell line with really strong phospho ERBB4. Not, not an obvious correlation there. Um, and we looked at two different phosphorylation sites on ERBB4. So um, it didn't correlate with abundance or phosphorylation. Uh, we also looked to see if the state of the, of the EGFR, ERBB2, or ERBB3 could also have an effect. And we looked at their phosphorylation levels. And once again, you know, we could spend some time on this, I won't bother. Um, comparing responsive to non-responsive, there was no obvious difference. So we were left with this, un, you know, unsatisfying situation of having resistant cells and sensitive cells, but not really understanding the difference. So um, we thought we would do a gene expression profile on these cells. So we looked at, we had these two groups. We had three cells that were sensitive and, 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 and four that were resistant. And so we put them through gene expression and asked, is there anything in their gene expression that would um, correlate specifically with responsiveness? Could, could we find a difference, right? So um, that's what you're looking at here. Um, these are the sensitive cells, is that, get that, did I get that right? Sensitive cells, resistant cells, and um, uh, right, we ran, ran that, did, 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 tr we, did them, we did them in untreated cells. We did that because we kind of wanted to know what was at that baseline. We also did the treated ones, but that gets more complicated. Uh, we did high seq sequencing, you know, assembled them into genes, identified which genes were responsive, and then compared them, compared these results among this population to um, data that had been, where these cell lines had been treated by, um, had been looked at in the CCLE data. So we had our own RNA-seq data and we also looked at the CCLE data. I'm not going to go through all of the informatics that we did to kind of sort this out, but in the end what we did was look at which pathways, which gene pathways were best correlated with responsiveness. This is a diagram of um, gene expression that shows a difference between sensitive versus resistant. So red means it drives resistance and blue means it drives sensitivity. And the bigger the dot, the more the effect, okay? Um, uh, or actually the more the p-value, I should say. Um, and so what you can see is, this, so here's the SMARC A4, for example. Um, but we were focusing right here on WINT5A and DKK1. And the reason these two really stood out for us is these are opposing proteins. This guy inhibits that guy. So they are directly in opposition and they're acting in opposition. This guy drives resistance, this guy drives sensitivity. And so um, they were among the 10 most predictive genes and we decided to follow them a little bit more closely. The one of the question was can you take a non-responsive cell and make it sensitive by blocking WINT5A? So our, mo our model is that WIN5A drives resistance. So the question was, could you, could you change that? Um, and so um, Femina did this work. She took, she took the cells. She used um, a WIN5A SH SHRNA. She tried several of them, and she found a couple right there that worked pretty well. She created cell lines with knockdown WIN5A and showed that, in fact, now they are a little bit sensitive to the drug, right? So this is using scramble shRNA, and then these two are both um, the target sRNA. So, so you can make the cells sensitive by doing that. And she did that in two different cell line backgrounds, which is heroic, <laughs> right? Um, and so then the, then the flip question is also present. So here we made the cells more sensitive. So the question is, could we take a, a sensitive cell and make it resistant by giving it WIN5A, right? And so she did, so um, yeah, so she did that experiment. It turns out if you take um, cells that produce a lot of WIN5A, if you take their media, just the cell culture media,
you can, there's a lot of Wnt5a in the media. The protein's right there. And this is the evidence for that. And so if she treats the cells, um, a sensitive cell line with, with Wnt5a, so this is with Wnt5a and this is without, you can see that they are much less sensitive to drug. So Wnt5a does what we predicted it does, right? So that's all I have on that story, but it kind of illustrates for you kind of what, what you hope that your proteomic studies will do, right? They will open up a new idea, a new possibility. In this case, they indicated a new drug that targets a protein that wasn't previously thought to be related to cancer, allowed us to explore that, uh, that protein as a possible cancer protein, and, and kind of pick apart a little bit of a story that we think reflects back on the biology and the disease which is what we're really trying to do, right? Our real goal here is to understand uh, disease. It's not just to, to use a technology. It's to use that technology to study something. So in conclusion, you have learnt about how to perform functional studies and especially AMP installation assays using NAPA technology. As I mentioned, studying PTMs are not straightforward. You need very sensitive technologies, you need very careful assay design to really try to capture how a post transitional modification happens in cells. As a result, the NAPA technology very elegantly offers you a very novel platform to look at high throughput manner how the PTMs can be studied. You also studied about high throughput screening on human studies as well as the one step autoacetylation on NAPA arrays. Today you were also introduced to the non-selective kinase inhibition on arrays and how NAPA technology could be employed for performing such assays very easily. You are exposed to the concept of identification of drug targets using NAPA technology. In the continuation of trying to give you the feel of how protein microarrays and the technology associated with microarrays could be utilized for different applications. In next few lectures, we are going to talk to you about different type of array platforms and different clinical applications how this could be utilized for other biologically relevant problems. You will see how to perform a protein microarray experiment in the laboratory settings. We are directly from my proteomics laboratory. Some of my senior PhD students will show you the various assays and steps performed in doing microarray based experiments. It will definitely give you much better idea about this technology as well as the intricacies involved in doing the experiments in the laboratory settings. In case if you are planning to apply these technologies in your own research, I think these exposures are very valuable and really needed to take your understanding to the actual experiments and try to employ that in your own work. So in the upcoming lectures, we will use different types of microarray chips for these experiments as well as some demonstrations will be uh, given to try to convey you the protocols involved in doing these experiments. Although the basic principles and the workflow almost remain same whether you use the in vitro transcription translation based protein arrays like NAPA or you used purified protein arrays like UPROT which we will be also showing or you use reverse phase arrays. Variety of these array platforms, uh, the starting materials could be different but ideally you will see the workflows remains very similar. But depending on what the objective is, you are looking at a very specific potential interactor, you are looking at protein modification, you are looking at a biomarker immunoglobulin protein or you are looking at some sort of inhibitor assay, accordingly your experimental design has to be changed and you have to thoughtfully carefully think about 
what should be my best controls for giving me answers or the right answers to address these questions. So, you learn about some of these aspects more in the upcoming lectures and I hope you will be then very confident about how to use this one of the very promising technologies for variety of discovery and functional studies in your own work. Thank you. Thank you.